But they can't pull her out. There is no heavy equipment. So he kept hearing her voice until she passed away. That there was a person who had just gotten evicted. Last night I learned a story of a young man that was given an eviction notice from his apartment the day prior to the earthquakes hitting. And he said, I was living on the street, I was homeless, and I woke up in the morning and witnessed the very same apartment building that I used to live in collapse and turn to rubble and turn to dust. And I said, Alhamdulillah, for the one who evicted me from this apartment, because I could have easily been amongst those who passed away beneath those rubble. And I want you to imagine you're going about your day, and next thing you know that the earth underneath you is shaking. The amount of uh, Muslims around here, it's, it's pretty huge and uh, like the, this, the, the place, the location that you opened in basically it's far it's further south from the other, the other big masajid. And everyone, I know a lot of people that I used to, I come, my, my cousin lives nine minutes from here. Another uh, uncle of mine lives about five to ten minutes from here. This area, yani the masjid, alhamdulillah, opened up in an area that it's much needed. And this size, yani this, yani the center, this center is much needed for this area. And the idea of this center is needed for the whole state because we don't have anything like that in the whole state. The da'wah center where it's going to basically nurture and basically educate and it's going to basically spread Islam. <laughs> Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, welcome to the Deen Shamir, your host. Now I want you to imagine you're going about your day and next thing you know that the earth underneath you is shaking and the home that you were living in is no longer a home, it's just rubble. And then you're underneath that rubble and you can hear the voices on the outside but no help is coming, no help is coming. And you have so many cases like this in Turkey and especially here now in Syria. We got someone who is gonna bring us up to date on what's going on in Syria. Turkey, we have counts of over 40,000 plus people who have di died, lost their lives, can be up to like 200,000. Yes. I'm here with the president of Syrian Forum. <laughs> We have one God, His name's Allah, Allah And His final messenger's Muhammad Peace be upon Him This is our religion, Islam, Islam This is the Deen Show you're loving her, mashallah, all the work that you're doing. When I was ready to talk about it, I would only talk to you. Yes, and I was explaining how much respect I have for the faith of Islam. Welcome to the Deen Show. The Deen Show.
Dr. Safa, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, Shay? Alhamdulillah, how are you, my brother? Good, good, alhamdulillah. Am I, was I painting the picture right? You actually, you have people stuck under the rubble, and now they, you can hear. It's like, let's say you're, you're in another room now, mm -hmm. but you just got rocks all over you. You can't get out. Boulders, you know, from the construction of the buildings, and now I can hear your voice, you can hear me, but the people are stuck in there. Absolutely. And they can't get out. Absolutely. And in northern Syria, the reason uh, that this situation was happening over and over again, because unlike in, in southern Turkey, where where they had heavy equipment, and you have a government, you know, agencies being mobilized, bringing heavy equipment, in northern Syria, they had no heavy equipment other than what was available there for, for construction purposes. Uh, there was no heavy equipment. So people literally using shovels and using you know, their hands in some cases just to kind of dig to try to, to pull out uh, the survivors. Uh, and, and we have like stories after stories of people. Literally, there's one man was sitting holding the hand of his child. Who, they, he can reach her hand, but they can't pull her out. There is no heavy equipment. So he kept hearing her voice until she passed away. Uh, and literally, and so this li is, you've heard this story. This, so this is a child now. The fathers can they can actually touch. Her. He was holding, her, was holding hand, her hand, calming her down, telling her, "We will take. We will bring you out. You will be okay." And then, and then she, they couldn't because they don't have heavy uh, equipment. But how is that in the day, in the modern day, twenty twenty three? Sure. That mean you got uh, weapons being sent. You sure. know, people are coming together to you know get things over to Ukraine. Right. You know, United Nations and. And we can't get, you know, a, a, a forklift? Unfortunately, in Syria, in northern Syria, it's, it's any more no man's land. I mean, because it is literally blockaded from the south by the regime. Because the regime considers these people, people who don't deserve to die. In fact, there are scenes of when the regime used to send uh, uh, barrel bombs and drop them from the helicopters that are exactly the same as the scenes from the earthquake now. So he was causing them earthquake after earthquake. Unfortunately, the world was, you know, numb to that and, and nobody cared to look at it. That same regime cannot be trusted or expected to allow any aid to come through. In fact, the daughter of the president of the country put on, uh, tweeted that th those people in the north are terrorists. They don't deserve to, to live and they, sh they don't deserve any help. So any help coming directly to the Syrian government is not reaching the north. And Turkey, because of the political situation and the elections being close, uh, there's a lot of pressure on the government uh, saying you are helping foreigners and the Syrians before before your citizens. And so they, they had to show that their priority is their citizens, rightly so. As far as I'm concerned, they, they need to worry about their citizens. But that also resulted in the only crossing, border crossing from Turkey, which is Bab al Hawa, that was functional. That there's no aid that came through it for the first week almost. Uh, I mean, now there's a little bit of, of equipment coming through. There was a convoy that came from the east of Syria, from Deir Zor, from the tribal leaders who literally challenged the blockade and challenged the situation and, and kind of dared anyone to, to, to stop the convoy they sent. But they're tribal leaders. They're not governments. They're not, you know, I, you know international entities. Um, and so as a result, you have people fending for themselves under under extreme circumstance where where there's earthquake after earthquake yesterday there was a, a 6.3 or 6.4 uh, earthquake uh, that happened just yesterday by the way um, and so unfortunately when you look at the situation a lot of the people that passed away they really didn't have to necessarily I mean again as Muslims we believe at the end of the day it is Allah's Qadr those people you know but but you know, you look at the, the, the ability of humans to have saved lives 
and failed to do so, it's, it's incredible. The, the numbers don't have to be as high as they are. If it weren't for the fact that there were people who you can hear, you can see, but you cannot lift the big concrete pieces because you have no heavy equipment. And unless you were able to, to, to somehow get just enough you know, of a hole to pull them out, you, you really you know, were helpless. And honestly, you see some of the videos of people that, that that were hearing the voices and then and then not hearing the voices and knowing that the person on the other side has passed away they themselves honestly i worry about their mental health some of them literally are, are losing their bearings because they can't believe this that somebody needed my help i was right there and then they 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 passed away and i wasn't able to help them and it was you know situation after situation like that now, who was the person that tweeted this, that they don't need, deserve to live? It, the, the daughter of the president of Syria. The daughter of the president. She tweeted that those people in the north, they are terrorists. They don't deserve to live. So that young girl. I'm paraphrasing. That yeah. young girl that her father was holding her hand, she's a terrorist? Th th that's basically what, what, what the brainwashing of, of people within, within the government controlled. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How do people make sense of uh, it when they are ignorant to how things are progressing over there as far as politically? Like if you have, you, you're mentioning North, people think North Korea, South Korea, mm -hmm. is it North Syria, South Syria? Can you paint a picture like what exactly for the layman who's tuning in? You're like, okay, sure. I thought it's just one country. How, if sure. we're sending support, why is it not getting to these people? Sure. Why is it only getting to this other side? So so since the... the uh, revolution started in Syria in 2010-11, at one point about 80% of the country was outside of the control of the government. And then, you know, in 2015, with the interjection of Russia and Iran into the scene, they, they kind of supported uh, the, the regime and regained uh, a good swath of land, I would say maybe about 80% of, of the country now is back under his control, some of it nominally, but there's 20% that's outside of his control, particularly in the northwest of, of Syria, um, uh, basically a province called Idlib and part of the province of, of Halab and some of the northern part that extends all the way east. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, if you're aware about maybe a couple of years ago, Turkey declared like a, um, a border line of about 30 kilometers as being, being part of its uh, strategic uh, defense of itself. And that, so they, they can uh, uh, prevent the government forces to come in. So there's literally, if you can think about it, there's 900 uh, kilometers border between Turkey and Syria. Uh, uh, you know, a line of 30 miles extending from the far east all the way to the far west. And then in the far west, it dips down, uh, you know, maybe another 100 kilometers. So that, that's, that, that's, you know, uh, the damage is concentrated in this northwest area. In, in Idlib and part of what's called uh, rural Halab uh, province also. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where the damage is concentrated. So, so that, that piece is, is uh, uh, surrounded by, by the, the, the regime from, from the south and from the east. The west is really, uh, um, is mostly also the regime, but it's, it's the Mediterranean Sea and north it's, it's Turkey. Mm -hmm. And so they are boxed. They, are, they, are, they have no way to go, nowhere to go. And the international community have decided that those people don't, don't deserve to be heard, unfortunately. Can you repeat that? The international community that consists of who? Of United, United Nations, Nations. That, yeah, the five big ones in the United yeah. Nations, that, yeah, wow. absolutely. Uh, so what are the estimates now of total lives? So as we mentioned, both, I mean, there, there are numbers that combine Turkey and Syria. Between the two of them, is, uh, the number is, is a bit over 40,000. But as I mentioned to you before we started taping, is that, is that there's about 200,000 people who are unaccounted for. And after, you know, now nine, ten days and with, with like heavy tremors and with what would be considered new earthquakes, because 6.4 is no longer a, a tremor or an or a aftershock. It, you know, it, it's, a, it's an earthquake in its own right. Uh, what's the chances of I, those people I, I being alive? What, uh, this one just hit? This yeah, one, just uh, yesterday. Just, just yesterday. yesterday. Yesterday there was a 6.4 6 uh, earthquake in, in southern Turkey, in northern Syria. It, it was felt this time all the way to Egypt, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, people in, in Palestine, in Gaza, 
uh, felt the tremor in Jordan. They felt the tremor, but there was no damage any anywhere nor you know south of the area that's originally affected. How life can change so quickly, huh? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yes, yeah. yes. And so for us, as as a as an you know as a nonprofit who has been working for a decade, you know, in the areas that 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 got affected, uh, and really our work, our motto is rebuilding Syrian lives, and we really kind of adopted it because you know that the the extensive destruction that the regime have left in the areas outside of its control is unspeakable but but above it you know the the, the crushing of the soul of of a people that that rose seeking freedom all of a sudden to find themselves abandoned by everybody and so and so our organization is dedicated to that we've been working on on rebuilding projects we we try to rebuild lives uh, you know from psychological help to giving people small uh, uh, small business projects, you know, we can buy for somebody their seeds to do a you know the planting season. We we can buy somebody a couch so he can uh, use it to feed his family and and make a small business out of it. That was you know plus building rebuilding homes actually for people affected. That was our focus uh, before the, the the earthquake. It continues to be our focus. But the day the earthquake hit, we we have about. 1,800 uh, people working for the organization within th that northern part of Syria. And so we mobilized immediately. I mean, the main thing that we needed, first of all, shelters. So we set up about 180 uh, uh, like temporary sheltering places. Some of them were large, where we would have maybe like a 50 tents, or and some of them only like 20 tents or 30 tents, depending on the area. Uh, then we realized people need to, you know, need water. So so we set up like a watering, basically uh, sent watering containers or trucks, basically that that were stationed in different places. But then we realized people need to eat, so we did, you know, temporary soup kitchens and 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 uh, things to provide food. We started bringing in. Uh, things for them to to stand the the, the cold. So so we we have served. We estimate we have served fifty three thousand people since you know the, the the beginning from day one, and we were the first organization on the ground. Tell me, uh, Dr. Seba, if you were to go ahead and um, from a um, logistical standpoint, if mm -hmm. you were trying to get what needed to be get in there to save the lives when this mm -hmm. first hit. Mm -hmm. How far is the nearest country with the resources, and if and if it was to be done, how quickly could they have with all all of these uh, all of this red tape that you mentioned? Oh, certainly Turkey is the closest. Uh -huh. And as I told you, I mean, I, I have to acknowledge that Turkey, within its own constraints, both the fact that it's dealing with even a larger scale disaster, yeah. as well as the pressures on it internally and externally, it has done what it can. I I I don't you know I don't mean in any way. To, to signal that they have they have not done what they can, but still what they can is far short of what is needed given the disaster. Now, not, you know, two days ago or three days ago, that the Babel Hawa crossing was opened with for for some some uh, relief, some heavy equipments even. So we are seeing that, but but it's not anywhere near what the need is. Uh, and that's the issue. Uh, uh, you know, Turkey is only like maybe less than 100 miles away from the majorly affected areas. In fact, in some places, it's only 20, 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. uh, but of the main, like there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a town called Janderis uh, in Syria. It, it, it was the hardest hit. It's probably about 70 or 80 miles from Less than that, 50 miles from, from the border. What was your response? Uh, recently, you also had a French newspaper mm -hmm. who said we don't have to uh, uh, we don't have to throw missiles anymore. Yes, you know, uh, and making pretty much mocking the the victims. What, what was your response to it, that? It's so unfortunate. It's so unfortunate. It shows honestly the deep the deep hatred, the deep you know uh, disregard i mean it, it flies in the f disregard for human life disregard for for just pure humanity i mean it, it flies in the face of all the claims of human rights and 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 and, and being a humanitarian but it's free I speech mean, it, 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 well i mean it, it is it is free speech that's what uh, uh, what people uh, hide under sure 
Sure, absolutely. Uh, but you know what? The way I view it is that it, it shows, it exposes those people for who they are. Because most of the time they are able to hide behind being humanitarians, being, you know, libertarians, being, you know, uh, being do-gooders. And, and those kind of uh, publications uh, expose them for who they are. Um, but for us, we just need to continue to work hard uh, on on alleviating the situation on the ground, and, and just not not be distracted by that. Though market as you know, we know what those people those people are. Mm-hmm. There's uh, stories, and, and there's a lot of these, but one in particular where a person was narrating that there was a person who had just gotten evicted. Here's a lesson that we all can take from the devastating earthquakes that took place in Turkey and Syria. Last night, I learned a story of a young man that was given an eviction notice from his apartment the day prior to the earthquakes hitting. And he said, I was living on the street, I was homeless, and I woke up in the morning and witnessed the very same apartment building that I used to live in collapsed and turned to rubble and turned to dust. And I said, Alhamdulillah, for the one who evicted me from this apartment, because I could have easily been amongst those who passed away beneath those rubble. And he said, I saw the very same landlord that evicted me. He became my neighbor in the tent. SubhanAllah, this is the reality of dunya, that your life can completely change overnight. So be grateful for the things that you have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُلَّ مَنْ عَلَيْهِ حَثَانٌ وَيَبُقَ وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Everything in this world will fade away, will pass away. And the only thing that will remain is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm-hmm. That day got evicted from his house Mm -hmm. and next thing you know he left the earthquake happened so if he was in there so he thought this is the worst thing that could have happened to me he was out absolutely uh he was homeless but then shortly a while a little while later he found his landlord a victim also homeless yes you see how yes. things incredible, can absolutely incredible you hear stories, stories like this. Absolutely yeah. incredible stories like that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know, yesterday I was hearing somebody uh, uh, caught my attention. Uh, somebody was telling me it's not related to the to earthquake, but somebody that was told, you know, what if we give you ten million dollars? Because he was saying, you know, money makes happiness, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and and he said, great. They said, but you're going to die next year. I said, no, 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 no. If you give me 10 million, I need to enjoy them. They said, no, they're making it 30, 100. No. So the deal is off. So there are things that more impo- are more important than money. In the case of this landlord, you know, mm-hmm. he, if he were to realize what's coming, maybe he would have thought differently about evicting somebody because they couldn't, they couldn't make their payment on time. Yeah. You know? It just puts things in perspective now. Absolutely. What, what is uh, the most precious because you can Absolutely. see... You're just enjoying your life in a split second. Absolutely. You know, the earth literally is just uh, swallowing you up, up, opening up. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we live in a culture that kind of tries to convince us that money is everything. Money and fame is everything. And and then this makes you realize that, Mm -hmm. no, it's not. It may make life a little easier, but there are things that are far more valuable than money. And um, for for the atheist, for the person who's void of mm-hmm. believing in the creator of the heavens and the earth, uh, mm-hmm. as Muslims, obviously, we have some solace knowing mm-hmm. that, you know, potentially people who have died in this situation, mm-hmm. they'll be uh, considered martyrs, God yeah. willing, inshallah. And now they will end up transitioning to mm-hmm. the next life and they'll Absolutely. have everything uh, and beyond you, what you can imagine. Absolutely. But if you don't have that hope, if you don't have that waiting for you and now you've lost everything, how do Absolutely. you make sense of it without the hereafter? How? Absolutely, How absolutely. You, you can't, no? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I agree with you 100%. Mm-hmm. Uh, and li- life is a story. And you know something, that, that, that one thing that I heard that was most like uh, convincing in that regard as far as believing in the afterlife, um, and I know we are kind of getting off the subject a bit, but, you know, imagine if, if there's a twin developing in their mom's womb yes. right and they spend nine months together and there are research now that indicate that mm-hmm. they play together i mean those like with the membrane between them yes. they they will they will rub on each other's you know uh, hands and fingers and, yes. and cheeks and stuff so so they are they are beings they are you know so imagine if one of them gets born just an hour before his brother or sister uh-huh. right what do you think if that if that being have ability to to express and think and what do you think they would be feeling? So one is outside of the placenta, the exactly. other one is still in the, and placenta, the other inside in, in the womb. Yeah, the one in the womb is going to think that he lost his brother or sister, the one they've known all their lives. 
they will be grieving them, they will be feeling this is a catastrophe, this is a horrible thing. On the other hand, what's happening? You have people smiling, congratulating each other, Beautiful receiving example. a baby, you know, happy. You know, it's the same way when we end our lives. Now, the ones who were happy at birth, now they are sitting, uh, you know, sad, uh, having lost somebody, thinking that this is the worst thing that could happen to them. But on the other side, trust me, it's another beginning, similar to the one that we were celebrating when somebody was, yeah. was born. It, but, but there, it, it's one of two things. It's either, it's either a, a, a piece of paradise until the day of judgment, or your grave, you know, gets gets uh, tightened on you until you can't breathe, mm -hmm. and and it's our deeds in this journey, in this life, that's going to determine what happened there. Yes. So, so to me, it, it is so, yani uh, fitra, it it is so intuitive to believe that there is something afterward, because this couldn't be the whole story, absolutely could not be. And and when you think about justice and injustice, also, how many tyrants they died at the height of their power and strength, having wronged people, killed people. If that's the end, do you think like they got away with it? Mm -hmm. I, I can't take that. I can't believe that. I yeah. have to believe that they are going to stand for accounting and pay for it. And it doesn't have to be a tyrant or a, anyone who wronged somebody and got a quote-unquote, in our terminology, got away with it. There has to be an accounting for it. Otherwise, th this life becomes very difficult, very tough. Absolutely. Uh, and be becomes you know free for all and mm -hmm. and, and it, it really you can't you can't um, then uh, uh, convince anybody of morality or, or doing the right thing mm -hmm. because they will think if I do the right thing then I'm stupid and and that's what happens with a lot of people who don't believe in the hereafter yeah. is that they turn into not very pleasant human beings and not very uh, kind or fair or just a human being not all some you know it's a lot more complicated than, than the way I'm putting it, but in general, this is I, what happens. I like people this who don't, this pe People who don't believe in the hereafter, they, they really, it, it takes them to very dark places within themselves and in their relation to, to other people mm -hmm. around them. Yeah, and then, and then you're tweeting stuff like, these people don't need uh, help and yeah. their X, Y, and Z labeling mm -hmm. them. So before yes. we conclude, um, hypocrisy, mm -hmm. uh, I want to touch upon this word because sure. we, we saw it when... Um, with Ukraine, when you had the migrants oh, I, and you saw this, uh, are we seeing some of that here? I, I believe so. Yeah. I, I believe we continue to see that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you elaborate on that? I mean, honestly, to, to me, um, the world have always known this, that it's not the injustice, but upon whom it's being done. And if it's being done on certain people, then everybody gets uphold are, are, and everybody reacts. And everybody is it safe to say are those... Are those uh, uh, certain people, Muslims? I mean, like the number speaks, 80% of the world's refugee population is Muslims. Mm -hmm. I don't know what percentage, but almost, almost, I want to throw again another 70, 80% of, of the, the war ravaged areas around the world mm -hmm. is populated by majority Muslims. And so, so as a result, you know, the victims, the, the you know the the, the refugees, the the the, the 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 underprivileged, all of them, the high number, high majority of them, and unfortunately, you know, as we see, is that normally, uh, the the world powers are not in a hurry to hear the cries of of the victims or the cries because of who they are, what mm -hmm. their religion, what their ethnicity, Very and sure. and there's enough evidence to show that yeah. honestly. So uh, we wanted to do our small part to create some more awareness and to yes. go ahead and uh, see what we can do. And I like the story. It gives things and put things in perspective also for people who are like, why is this happening? How would you answer that for someone who is Muslim? And I mm -hmm. say, why is this uh, happening to Muslims? Why is this? Sure. And they don't uh, put in perspective that, you know, earthquakes uh, were happening in other regions also and, and that. But they think, okay, how can they cope with this, this loss sure. and whatnot? Uh, wh sure. what, how do you put that in perspective? Sure. I mean, you know, there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that says, إِنَّمَا تُنْصَرُونَ بِضُعَفَائِكُمْ That you are given aid and victory by Allah because of the, your weakest mm -hmm. and most vulnerable. And it is well known that when he used to prepare to go out on an expedition or a battle, he would bring the women and children to pray, to make dua for him. This, this idea that, so, so related to that, you know, th that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Um, gives us uh, gives us 
our weakest, our poorest, our underprivileged, our outcasts as a test. How are we going to act towards them? Uh, and without it, we can't prove our faith, really. Mm -hmm. And so, so those things happen. First of all, as you said, they happen to everybody. But when they happen, then they are really more than they are a test for the person who's being affl afflicted. They are a test for the rest of us. Are we going to run to their aid? Are we going to make sure that they are, they are taken care of? If somebody is poor, are we making sure that their, their sustenance, their, their necessities at least are provided for them? Are they cared for? And if we as a society, uh, our reaction is that we don't care, then we have shown that we are lacking in faith, no matter how much we have the appearance of faith, no matter how long our beards are, our, you know, how much we put our, our foreheads to the ground. It, 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 th those people are tests for us, whether it's the earthquakes, whether it's the wars, whether it's whatever, it's tests for the rest of us. How are we going to react? What are we going to do in the face of this? Um, and those of us who are able to, 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 to extend a hand and alleviate a suffering, uh, inshallah, they are the ones who are passing the test. So how can people support now if they want to help those uh, victims here of this earthquake there in specifically in Syria? Sure, sure. Because you sure. have the organizations called the uh, sure. Syrian Forum? Yes. And then how can people be sure that now it's not going to get stopped here, there, everywhere else, but get to the people on the ground there for, for sure. help. Sure, and, and I want to say a point in this regard, by the way. There were organizations that were hit themselves because they were located in Ghazi Antab in Turkey, which itself got hit, etc. I mean, we are located in Ghazi Antab, but our headquarters in Istanbul, so we didn't get hit. So some of them themselves couldn't respond until about a week later because yeah. they first had to deal with their own you well, know yeah. situation for us as an organization a larger organization alhamdulillah we had we had our credits with with vendors that we have been dealing with for for a decade so we were able to reach them and say supply me with a hundred tents i'll give you the money i'll get you the money but supply me now so like the next day we were getting supplies mm -hmm. we were getting you know uh, foods we were getting you know things we need you know um, b b very quickly and, and now that, that the situation got streamlined we are ev even more able to, uh, to deliver and also we have a very good history and rapport with the Turkish governments with the Walis of, of the different provinces that are bordering you know Syria that we are able to move uh, the supplies and what we need and by the way one thing that I want to mention is that we, we had a, a wonderful and we continue to have a wonderful relationship with SAMS the Syrian American Medical Society that, that really have partnered up with us and between the two of us I mean I would say if we have provided help for about 53,000 they probably have done something similar so so those two organizations have really worked together beautifully to, to show case how when we work together you know uh, uh, benefits more, more people so we are able we are we, we are ready. Uh, people can can send donations, you know, through Zelle. They can go to our website, syrianforum.org. Uh, uh, we, we, you know, they can they can send us Zelle also info at, at syrianforum. Uh, dot org and and we would receive we will receive uh, those and we put them into use immediately. We have we have the infrastructure. We have the ability to immediately impact people on the ground. Thank you. Thank you for uh, bringing us up to speed Absolutely. on what's going on in Syria. And, My absolute uh, pleasure. May Allah alleviate their pain and suffering Ameen. and bring relief Ameen. And, Ameen. and reward all those who contribute Ameen. to Ameen. be a part of that. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you.